I'm Greg Hunter. Welcome to USAWatchdog.com. With us, uh, financial expert, gold, silver expert, Alistair McLeod coming to us from the other side of the pond. Thank you, Alistair, for joining us today on USAWatchdog.com. That's my pleasure, Greg. Gold and silver last week, uh, it looks like that they are uncorking and they are going to start running to the upside. Is, is this it or is this going to get smashed down again uh, in terms of, uh, of you know, the, the <laughs> now the official uh, uh, manipulation of gold and silver that's been going on? Is, is that going to go on some more? Well, it could well do. But I think um, the important point is that the, the big investment houses – uh, the analysts have all been bearish on gold. They missed the bottom, and I think they're sort of having to think again. Their trading desks are definitely buying gold now because traders always, you know, they, they, get, they get the trend and they go with it. But um, the, the, the sort of economists, the macroeconomic community, um, you know, that sort of analyst basically just doesn't get it, and they, I think they've just completely missed it. The important point is... I think the most important point is that actually the dollar has turned. The panic move into the dollar as um, you know, miners and producers of raw materials are suddenly realizing that they've got dollars to pay and their products, uh, the value of their products was falling, so they had to go and sort of get some dollar cash. That was driving the dollar up. That has now ceased because China has now started buying those raw materials uh, you know, sort of base metals, oil, and so on and so forth. So the result is that the commodity crisis is over, and that actually is the biggest driver in the dollar, which is pushing it down. Do you think that uh, long term, uh, well, even near term, uh, a lot of people are very scared about what's going on? Apple announced its first, uh, you know, in 10 years that they weren't selling more iPhones. A week before that, uh, Intel laid off 11% of its global workforce. Uh, uh, consumer confidence down. Uh, housing starts down. Manufacturing down. Are you getting the trend there? Uh, are, are they afraid that, that we, we could have a, a, a calamity, a, a grind to a halt in the. You know, uh, uh, the uh, Baltic Dry Index up a little bit, but way down from its from 2008 and whatever. Do you think that they, that the powers that be could they be worried about an uh, an economic slowdown that could turn into a calamity? I think they are. I mean, what's interesting is that they've um, they've devised the statistics, and the statistics always say that everything is hunky dory. You know, like you've got less than five percent unemployment in the states and. The CPI is hardly moving. Um, you know, we need to stimulate it to get it up. But actually, the underlying business conditions are not good. Um, and what we've seen for some considerable time is U.S. corporations have increased their borrowing. What, to invest in uh, production? No, to buy, buy back shares, to, if you like, artificially inflate their earnings. And uh, there comes a point where if you haven't got the underlying cash flow, you can't do that anymore. And I think there's a concern in the markets that we are getting close to that point. Plus, if you go outside um, the United States and you look at the Eurozone, the banking system there is extremely fragile. Um, you have a, um, a buy-in of a buyout that failed in Austria, the HEPA um, uh, bank. And you've also got the Italian banks, which are in very, very shaky, a very shaky position. And, of course, you've got two major banks uh, which are effectively being uh, rescued, if you like. They're in corporate rescue. One is Deutsche Bank and the other is Credit Suisse. So, you know, we have a very unhealthy banking situation. Um, and if you look at the asset side of the bank's balance sheets, they own uh, sovereign debt, Eurozone sovereign debt, which has been driven up to completely unrealistic prices by the ECB's um, uh, QE. I mean, who would lend money to Italy at 1.4% for 10 years? I mean, it's just uh, completely nonsensical. So you have markets which are um, held up artificially, and at some stage, that is going to change. At some stage, those markets are going to fall. I don't know what the trigger will be, but when it happens, watch out. And I think that we all you, know... You think, it'll be, you think it'll be a crash. You don't think it'll be an easy, a soft landing, as they say. You think uh, that things are so haywire, uh, out of whack, and you mentioned Italy loaning money for, you know, one and a half percent or whatever. Uh, you're saying that, that when, it, when it goes, it goes big, it goes hard. Yes, I mean, wh whenever uh, markets uh, get mispriced, the correction is always very sudden, unexpected, and hurts a lot of people. Now, we don't have it just in one market, we have it in all markets. So, um, 
I would expect on that basis alone that when the thing starts sliding, it's going to be very, very big and actually could be systemically, um, you know, sort of you know, systemically, I mean, just, just appalling. You're over there uh, in Europe. What do you make of the Deutsche Bank admission that, uh, yeah, we rig, we rig silver? It was funny. Uh, five hours later, four hours later, it comes out, oh, yeah, we rig gold, too. <laughs> I mean, what do you make of that? And then they finger, you know, all these primary dealers and treasuries, uh, Bank of Nova Scotia and also HSB HSBC. Of course, Deutsche Bank is a primary dealer. What do you make of that? Big collusion. That's a big-time admission, is it not? Well, Greg, are we surprised? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's um, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, with this, this story actually goes back. You you may recall, or your listeners may recall, that um, Deutsche Bank was in the silver fix and also was in the gold fix, and uh, they decided not to. They decided to just abandon their seat in the silver fix for a brief period of time. They tried to sell their gold seat, failed completely. So you knew there was something big cooking underneath, and I think this is now coming out and. Um, it doesn't surprise anyone, particularly people like, um, you know, the, the, the guys around at uh, Gata. Um, you know, it's, it's now come out into the open. And I think this is a story which is going to get quite expensive for some of these big banks. Gold and silver vaulting higher. Uh, they uh, had a huge week this uh, last week. Uh, what do you make of that? Is, is that? is that the king has no clothes, the jig is up? They're not going to be able to be doing the uh, manipulation as they did in the past, at least forcing it and suppressing it down. I think that's true. But, of course, we mustn't forget that there are things like exchange stabilization funds, which can operate in the futures market and, indeed, I guess, do operate in the futures markets. So um, you could get uh, the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury, through the exchange stabilization fund, trying to um, steady the market. But I, my overall sense of it is that I don't think anymore that the um, central banks are particularly worried about the gold price going up. I think what does worry them is the thought that it will go up very quickly, because that would certainly impose huge strains in, in the bullion market and could in, indeed embarrass the bullion banks, because they are always short of physical. I mean, it's, it's the nature of the beast. So, um, you know, a very, very strong gold price, I think, could generate um, a, a, a crisis in the London bullion markets, for example. It could create a crisis on COMEX if that leads to pressure to deliver. And what is interesting is that this is happening at a time when we've got the new gold fix in Shanghai uh, fixed in, in the Chinese currency, the yuan. So there the are quite a few things coming together in terms of um, on the demand side, which look as if it's going to t uh, you know, sort of remove physical from people who are basically short of paper. Could they just clean out the LVMA and COMEX in just one shot? Bill Holter is one of the guys that's been, been saying, hey, you know, a little more than a billion dollars, you can clean out both markets, and that's no money to a sovereign. That's no money to China or Russia or just about anybody else. Could they just be saying, hey, you know, this is about all the silver and gold we're going to be getting. We've played your game for the last five years, and now time's up. We're going to take it all. Deliver. And they could just <laughs> crash the market and vault the price higher? Doubtless they could. I think we mustn't underestimate the liquidity of the market, however, because it is, it is a huge market. I mean, the above-ground stocks are, what, 170,000 tons. Um, the amount in bars floating around, I should think, are probably in the order of about fifty or 60,000 tons. I mean, it is, we're talking about huge liquidity in that market, most of which, by the way, is locked up. So you're right in the sense that um, you know, a really big buyer, you know, if they went in for, say, 10,000 contracts or the equivalent in physical, um, it would create a huge problem. We can certainly see that. My problem with um, expecting that is that I can't see in whose interest it is to do that. The only country, perhaps, who might consider doing it, or would have considered doing it, might have been Russia. But, but um, I can't see this in their interest. I don't think, I don't think China or anyone else really wants to be responsible for destabilizing the financial system. I think they would rather the financial system destabilized itself without um, us being able to point a figure and say, finger and say it's those Chinese. You know, they're, they're fighting a financial war, and we've got to fight back. That doesn't really suit anyone. So I can't see that that's, that's, that's likely to happen. But I do see a shortage 
um, showing itself from time to time. And you could get some fairly spectacular moves in the gold price and also the silver price, which has uh, suddenly begun to catch up. Uh, you know, they've had this, the idea of there could be a calamity is, uh, we just had all these meetings in Washington a few weeks ago. I mean, you had emergency meetings, I don't know, three emergency meetings with the Fed, and at least one with, uh, and we don't know about the phone calls, Janet Yellen and the Vice President and the President of the United States. The idea of a, some something amiss uh, is certainly not that far-fetched, uh, especially now now that we know that the, the entire gold and silver market have been manipulated by primary dealers of treasuries. So uh, do you think something is amiss? Uh, if you were a fly on the wall in the meeting with Janet Yellen and the president and vice president, what do you suppose Janet Yellen told them, or what do you suppose they asked her? What do you suppose they're worried about with all these negative um, implications in the market and all these tech companies going down and all these uh, you know, price swings and gold going up and uh, admissions of rigging? What do you suppose the president and vice president asked her? What do you suppose she told them? I think actually it wasn't quite about that. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect it was actually about the Saudi Arabian problem. Uh, Saudi Arabia may be on the verge or might have been on the verge of selling treasuries. And there were two reasons that, that, that drives this thought. The first is the redacted information about 9-11 which might have been a trigger. The second point is that Saudi Arabia is, in, is, is, um, is suffering huge financial liquidity problems. This oil price drop that we had uh, over 2015 has hurt her very, very badly. I don't think she ever expected the price of oil to fall that much. The result is that the government has had to go out, and for the first time since Saddam Hussein in, invaded Kuwait, They've gone into the, um, into the market and they've borrowed $10 billion in a syndicated loan of five-year money. At the same time, they are said to be selling 5% of Aramco, which should raise them about $100 billion. I personally think that that sale um, would probably go completely over to China. I think China would buy the lot in one go with her uh, safe fund, her sovereign wealth fund. But the point is that if um, the... Uh, the stories that uh, Saudi Arabia might have dumped up to three quarters of a trillion dollars worth of treasuries on the market, imagine that would have just completely collapsed uh, the, the whole global financial system. Because if you undermine the price of uh, the top, top um, collateral, which is U.S. treasuries, then you can see that the effect goes all the way down the pile into other currencies as well. And I think that, I mean, that would explain why Obama was involved, because it then becomes a foreign affairs matter. So um, that was, that's my theory anyway. And I, because, uh, you know, when we see yesterday that uh, the Fed comes out with no change in interest rates and a pretty sort of boring statement just justifying their position, this is not something to have two uh, meetings, um, you know, sort of specially expedited meetings uh, and uh, a meeting with President Obama. You know, I'm sorry, it's got to be something else. It's got to be something bigger. And I think that the, uh, for my money, I think it was the Saudi situation that did it. And that's not really over yet. I mean, they have oil deals with China. Some people say they're going to start pricing oil, if not already, selling oil in Yuan, at least covertly, if not overtly. And, you know, we made this deal with Iran and Saudi Arabia, is, you know, all of a sudden they're like, what, what? you're giving them $100 billion? Uh, you didn't sign anything? You didn't even sign anything? And uh, then now, now the Ayatollah, the Supreme Leader, is complaining that, that hey, we're not really, uh, you know, adhering to the deal. Well, because there is no deal. <laughs> all right? There is no, if there, you know, I wouldn't, if yeah. you sold me your house and you didn't sign a contract and I'd hand you, you know, uh, uh, 300, 500, you know, 600,000 uh, a pound or whatever you live in or whatever house you live in, yeah, would that be a deal if we didn't sign a contract? No, no that, deal at all. I mean, just be no giving you some money. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, I, th th the whole of the geopolitical situation in the Middle East is fascinating. It's very complicated, and I, th I think it would be too complicated for me to go into it in detail. But suffice to say that from China's point of view, she wants to get Saudi Arabia on her side. Yes. Saudi Arabia is bust. She needs money. This, to me, is a marriage made in something or other. But what it means is that Saudi Arabia is going to be moving away from the American sphere of influence, more into an Asian sphere of influence, 
led by China. Because remember that, the, that China uh, uh, heads up, along with Russia, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which when the current um, uh, intended members join, on top of the existing members, will total 4 billion people. This is the majority of the planet's population, will be in one economic block. Saudi Arabia wants to be in that block. China can give them 100 million for 5% of Aramco, no bother at all. That gives um, uh, Saudi Arabia the liquidity she needs, and she's going to hope that the oil price rises so that she, she can just let out her treasuries gradually rather than have to uh, go into some sort of fire, fire sale. So, uh, to my mind, I think it is actually, that is the play which is so important, and I think that the potential of Saudi Arabia panicking Moving out of the American sphere of influence, where suddenly they haven't got any friends in Washington from their point of view, um, you know, why should they hold treasuries? And there, there they are in Washington talking about um, uh, blaming them for involvement in 9-11. Now, whether that's true or not, I honestly don't know. Um, I think it is quite possibly true that there are wild elements in, um, in that Sunni state that would have uh, uh, had something to do with it. But you can see that from the diplomatic point of view, Saudi Arabia would be very upset by this. And the idea that, you know, they've got a continuing relationship with America. No, we haven't. Our interests are going elsewhere. We don't sell any oil to America. We sell it all to China and India and so on. Right. We don't need the dollar anymore. We don't need treasuries anymore. That is actually where they are at the moment in terms of trying to deal with their current financial difficulties. And I think it's a very delicate situation. And that, to me, would be reason enough for two of these very important meetings at the Fed and for the president to be briefed. And they don't have to sell oil in dollars. I mean, if they're selling to China, why would they need dollars? They would just say, we'll take your currency. And, they, and they also, the Chinese, tell me about the, the gold back yuan. I mean, wouldn't that be the currency the Saudis would love, a gold back currency? And then it would be a twofer, right? We could get rid of the dollar, and we'd just didn't have the yuan anyway. Well, the yuan is not gold backed. Well, um, it could be, though. I mean, it, it, it could be. And I have uh, little doubt that at some stage in the future, there will be um, some sort of link between the yuan and gold. My guess is that when that happens, it would probably have to happen at a far higher gold price. Because there is a level, I think, where, um, you know, from the Chinese point of view, they've got gold, they've got dollars. What's that relationship going to be? Um, you know, what's the stable level between those two as far as the Chinese are concerned? And I think that level is probably well above the current level. So that's not, I think, um, on the horizon at the moment at all. But... China, I think, with the yuan ha and Saudi Arabia, has a slightly different problem. They want to internationalize their currency. They can do this by cutting deals with oil producers, with other commodity producers in Africa, and so on and so forth. But what they've got to do is they've got to be very careful that they don't export a whole load of yuan, only to find that there isn't really the underlying demand for it there, and it starts coming back back and weakening and weakening the, the, their own currency. So they've got a currency management problem, and I think they're focusing on that. So what they will do, and this is something, something I've suggested in an article today, I think they might lend dollars to Saudi Arabia, as well as this deal, um, uh, the potential deal of buying a stake in Aramco. They could lend dollars to America with a conversion back to yuan. Say with in to Saudi Arabia, time. lend dollars to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, exactly. And then Saudi sells them into the market. China is not selling into the market, so nobody can hold her responsible. Um, but the conversion will be into the, U into the yuan at a, uh, at a predetermined price, say, in five, ten years' time. Now, that, to me, allows China to control the ebb and flow of yuan so that she can manage the, 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 the currency rate. And if everything blows up uh, on our way to this beautiful, spectacular plan, then what happens? <laughs> well... China is always going to be in the position of saying it's not my fault. That's, that, is, that is her default position always. And she has never, ever put herself in a position where she will be blamed. Now that we have, this, this brings us to gold and silver because you are an expert in that arena as well. Uh, gold and silver, it looks like they've turned a corner 
Uh, give us your appraisal. Let's start with gold and let's work over the, to silver because a lot of people want some silver information uh, a, as well. Uh, gold, is it, has it turned the corner? Is it going much higher? Is all the, do all the stars align for much higher gold prices? I believe it is. The fundamental reason that precious metals are going better, well, let's, let's start with gold. The fundamental reason that gold is going better is the dollar is going weaker. The uh, strength of the dollar um, in 2015 was all about falling commodity prices. Commodity producers, mines and so on and so forth, uh, all owe dollars. And the result was when their income dropped, they had to, um, uh, if you like, cover the dollars which they weren't going to get rolled over. The banks weren't going to roll over dollars for, um, you know, Brazil, for um, uh, Glencore and so on and so forth. So there was a huge rationalization going on. Now that period is over. And the reason it is over is because China now has her 13th five-year plan, which is aimed at uh, developing the rest of Asia. Because I mentioned the Shanghai Cooperation Organization before. What she wants to do is to take all that part of Asia and, um, uh, if you like, uh, give it an industrial revolution, something that this country took 150 years. They're going to achieve in about 25 to 50 years. This is going to uh, require massive capital investment. It's going to require huge amounts of copper for electricity grids, apart from updating her own electricity grid, which she's behind on. It's going to require huge amounts of cement, huge amounts of iron ore. So you can see that, that you've got to turn round, if you like, uh, actually has now occurred in these commodities. And if commodity prices are rising, then by definition, the purchasing power of the dollar is falling. Now, remember that over history, the price of commodities measured in gold tends to gently fall over a long period of time. The price of commodities measured in dollars tends to rise over a long period of time and quite spectacularly. So if we go back to the 60s, you find that uh, the price of uh, commodities, uh, well, particularly oil, let's look at oil, the price of oil measured in gold has gone from something like two and three quarter uh, grams, gold grams, to one gold gram per barrel. At the same time, in dollars, it's gone from uh, $3.10 to the current level of about 45. So, in other words, while the purchasing power of gold uh, for oil has actually risen by two and a half times, the purchasing power of the dollar has collapsed to the point where it's lost over 90% of its purchasing power over that period of time. So you can see that uh, this relationship between the dollar and gold pricing commodities is the thing to watch. And I would argue that the time when commodity prices are falling, that is now over. The reason that people were panicking into the dollar is now over. China is now stockpiling all the raw materials that she needs to develop the whole of Asia. And we are talking something really quite, quite mega. And as a result, over this year, I can see that the natural drift in the dollar is going to be down. If you put on top of that, China's position of saying, well, I've got dollars. I don't know what sort of how many trillions of dollars she's got. Um, I can see they're going to go down. I need commodities. I can see the price is going to go up. So she's going to be selling dollars to buy commodities. And now we've got Saudi Arabia with, we are told, something like um, up to three quarters of a trillion of treasuries finding that she is in exactly the same position. So, uh, whichever everybody way... Everybody wants to sell at the same time. There's reasons for everybody to sell at the same time. They for don't foreigners, need exactly, for foreigners to sell. And this is the key thing, and this is, this, is, this is the problem that the Fed has, because however much they try and manage the domestic economy, they've got a problem that there's a huge, great pile of dollars outside America with actually very little reason for him to be outside America anymore. John Williams says 16 trillion outside of America. That's his estimate. 16 trillion. Um, I, it wouldn't it's a surprise stunning me amount. It wouldn't surprise me at all because we're talking about really from the time of the Nixon shock, which was 1971. Uh, they've been expanding um, uh, uh, money, if you like, for export in the form of raw money and bank credit, and it's gone on and on and on. And of course, the other thing which is interesting is that the last time we had a crisis um, with uh, the dollars going back to America, uh, and then that time they were, um, you know, the, the sellers were trying to get gold, 71. that led to, the, you know, to the, the end of the gold pool in the late 1960s. 
And that was directly related to the wind down of the Vietnam War after the Korean War. All those dollars have been sort of produced to finance these wars. This time round, we've now finished with Iraq, we've now finished with Afghanistan, almost. So you can see that uh, there is actually a very similar situation on, um, on the military front in terms of those dollars going back into America. Do you think that, uh, that they could reach a point where they would just, uh, James uh, Rickard says, you know, the president has emergency powers, he can just call over to the Treasury and say, stop redeeming Treasuries if too many of them come in. Woo. Do you think at some point, do you think they would just stop redeeming Treasuries? No. I mean, that would be such a crisis measure. They would just print tons of money. You're talking about well, big inflation then. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, I, I, you know, I, I, I am aware that, uh, that Jim Rickers has sort of come up with that theory. I mean, in, in, you know, in principle, yes. But think what it would do to the confidence in the dollar. It would just completely collapse it. Nobody would want it if America behaved like that. And they're no longer in the, in the position, by the way, to push us around in the way they have been able to push us around for the last 60 years. Do you think that uh, there could be a, a selling so great that it could hyperinflate the dollar, that if they would be forced, then you're in the camp that they would not uh, shut down the treasury market, which is the most, I would think would be bizarre, most liquid market in the world became illiquid overnight. Are you saying that, that then they would just print money come hell or high water? They would just print, and they would print, and they would redeem, and they would do whatever, and they would just say, the heck with it, we'll just have the hyperinflation. I don't think they would print. Um, what we have, though, Greg, is a situation where people's confidence in the dollar is actually what makes its price. If that confidence starts sliding, then the purchasing power of the dollar can fall without any further printing whatsoever. And I think we're rather in that situation. You, are you with me? It's, it's, it's very much yeah. a case of, of, of um, you know, sort of the preference, relative preference for money or goods. As that situation develops, um, you know, if people, let's say, decide they don't want to hold the dollar anymore, then what has always happened in the past, and we see this with Venezuela at the moment, is people need to get hold of cash in order to, to go and buy the goods, which they know are going to be more expensive tomorrow. Um, I think that's less of a problem nowadays because, of course, um, you know, the vast majority of transactions are all done on debit cards and credit cards. So, you know, it's all electronic nowadays, which probably means that the collapse could actually happen a lot more quickly than, say, the 1923 example in Germany where, um, you know, if you wanted to access your account, you had to go to the bank, you had to draw up money, or you wrote a check, it would take three days to clear. Um, no, no, that doesn't happen now. It all happens just like that. You know, just click a button and you've moved a million bucks. So um, it could, in theory, happen a lot more quickly, which um, could take a lot of people by surprise. Because I'm not yeah, saying this is going to happen, but I think, I think it, is, it, is, it is in the works, as it were, in the background and is a real threat. Uh, silver, I want to I make sure I get that in before we, we sign off. Silver, uh, bullish on silver. I know you're on some of your recent articles, you're worried about all the fiat. We're back to the fiat currency, digital or, or real. And I guess in your, and what you're saying, digital, all the fiat digital currency out there. And, and the benefactor is going to be gold and silver. And, and let's talk about silver. Yeah, well, silver, I think it's interesting. The, the silver production looks like um, declining for the first year in the last three or four years. Uh, and uh, at the same time, demand for silver continues to rise. I don't know what's going on in the States, but I tell you, over here, everybody's getting these solar panels. And, of course, China is the largest manufacturer of solar panels. They mine a lot of silver. The result is that silver is being starved, if you like, from anything else. Um, so the demand is there. And I think what's driving silver is not so much, um, you know, the thought that this, it has a monetary use. I think it is, it is pure industrial at this stage, coupled with the fact that it got very left behind. When, when, go, when the gold price started rising, silver actually rose at about half the rate, whereas traditionally we regard silver as being twice as volatile. In other words, if gold goes up $1, well, sorry, 1%, then silver will go up 2%. Um, it really got left behind, and it's now making up for it. But I think the underlying fundamentals are actually very positive for silver. And what are some of the other underlying monetary positive influence? I mean, over here we've had record sales of silver eagles. Uh, over here, I don't know if you have the equivalent over there in, in, the, in the UK, but record sales month after month for yeah. silver, uh, actually in, in, in coin form. Well, what do you think about that? 
Well, um, it, it, it squeezes uh, the situation even more, because if there is a shortage on the industrial side, uh, you can see that if there is any pickup in, uh, if you like, in investment demand, then it's really going to make the situation far more difficult, I think, for, um, you know, for buyers of, sil for, uh, of physical silver for, for industrial purposes. So I, I can see um, silver getting a momentum under it. And, um, you know, it always has been uh, a sort of, if you like, a, the poor man's form of money in the sense. Uh, but... Having said that, we're a long way from see, seeing silver being re-monetized. But I can see that if the, if the, if the price of silver continues to get uh, a, you know, this momentum developing under it, then I think, yeah, it could get a momentum of its own, and you could find that it goes up to the point where perhaps the gold-silver ratio falls from the current sort of 70-ish, 72, down to around about 50. I think it's a long way. Um, uh, it's a it's a it's a long way off saying that it is going to be remonetized and we're going to see the silver gold ratio back under twenty. I don't see that at the moment. I think it would be a very uh, uh, brave person to forecast that, even on a long term basis. But short term, the volatility is there. The relative volatility. I see gold going better, not because gold is going better, but because the dollar is going down, and on that basis, silver. Normally being twice as volatile, I think, is a very, very good play. Could we reach a situation where the dollar collapses and gold and silver skyrocket? Could we reach that situation if uh, everybody starts, you know, knocking on the dollar and, you know, you were bringing up Saudi Arabia and China and Russia and Brazil? Well, there's all kinds of uh, countries holding treasuries that wouldn't need them. They don't want them. You're talking about four billion people that says, eh, we don't really need the dollar anymore. Could there be, could, could there come a day where, in, in your theory, uh, which is excellent to point out that, you know, it's the dollars going bad. Could a dollar trouble get bad and just go completely down, uh, it, it go into free fall? Theoretically, yes. But I think we have to bear in mind that it's in no one's interest at all. And none of us um, will sort of, if you like, um, uh, begin to think of the dollar in terms of this is no longer money. We don't want to have that thought. Because if we have that thought about the reserve currency, we've also got that thought about the pound here, the euro in in um, uh, in, your, in the eurozone, and also uh, the yen. So, you know, paper currencies they are extremely convenient. We've got used to it, and the idea that they're completely valueless is a very difficult one for people to take on board. So, yes, theoretically, what you say can happen, but it's not necessarily going to happen overnight. And one last thing while I got you on here, uh, the exit European, uh, the uh, uh, the Britain exit of the euro, they call it the Brexit. Uh, does it look like, I mean, Obama was over there saying, really, you really shouldn't do that. All your money people from the city of London are, we shouldn't do that. But yet the people are saying, yeah, we should do that. The mayor uh, is saying that. A lot of other people are saying that, that you guys should exit. You're spending all this money. You don't have any control of your borders. You're spending billions of pounds to be in this organization. Uh, is Great Britain going to leave the euro, to leave well, the European Union? Putting my, my economist hat on, I hope so. <laughs> but um, the government tends to have an advantage in these things. And uh, they're arguing this from the case of, um, you know, hold on to nanny for fear of something worse. Um, it's an argument which is actually quite a strong one. But there are very strong ones the other way. And, uh, for example, the lack of democracy, um, the, the fact that on the continent you have the Code Napoleon as, uh, uh, as law. In other words, you can only do things that are permitted by the law on the continent. In English law, and the same in American law, you can do anything you like as long as it's not prohibited by law. So you can see that there is a fundamental conflict, if you like, in the way we have contract law, property rights, and all the rest of it, and markets uh, compared with uh, uh, on, uh, on the European continent. The European continent, they want to clamp down on markets. They don't like the idea of the city of London. Um, the legal situation is completely different. The uh, executive are not accountable in any way. They are above the law, whereas here under English law, the executive is not above the law. They are subject to the law as well. So there are a number of very, very important issues which nobody really wants to talk about. I suppose for fear of confusing the electorate, partly, um, because the electorate are hung on things like immigration, you know, all those sort of issues. 
when it comes to um, uh, uh, trade deals, I mean, that's a complete nonsense as well. The average um, tariff, if you like, going into Europe now is around about 3 3.5%. Three so actually, trade deals are not a huge, great uh, um, uh, uh, problem. I mean, obviously, the tar- the, there are higher tariffs on certain things. Um, but if we come out... I really don't see it's a problem. I think we would just resuscitate our old links with uh, the Commonwealth and say, you know, why not just let's have a completely free trade area? Um, You know, if you want to subsidize something uh, and make something cheap for us, then fine. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take that gift. What? You know, this is the sort of thing that status just do not understand. They just don't get it. But the fact of the matter is that we could have um, trade deals I think pretty well immediately, with all our old uh, Commonwealth and uh, ex-colonies and the old empire, if you like. And as well as that, I think if we went along to China and said, Mr. Xi, how about, you know, just a free trade deal? You know, anything you like. I think they would jump at it. So I really don't see we've got a problem. And actually, we do need something like that. I think to do two things. Firstly, to get the population in this country to understand the benefits of free markets and the disadvantages of, 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 of uh, state control. And the second thing is we do need to kick other countries up the backside and say, look, all this horsing around with trade deals is a complete waste of time. You just have free trade and you, you, know, you, you resolve it. You know, get rid of all these bureaucrats trying to organize these things. Um, you know, it's just a complete waste of time. So free trade. So your money is on an, uh, a Brexit. Your money is on Great Britain leaving the Eurozone. No, that's not where my money is. I don't actually... I, I think the odds at the moment favour um, us, unfortunately, staying in. Uh, my heart tells me, and my economic analysis tells me we're far better out. Alistair McLeod, thank you so much for joining us today on USAWatchdog.com. Really appreciate you coming on and giving us your unique global perspective. You took us <laughs> to school. Thank you, Alistair, for joining us on USAWatchdog.com. That's very much my pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Craig.